Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. You know, there are so many discs out, singleton discs, devoted to a composer who you've probably never heard of, and they're just marvelous. I mean, there's some really great music out there, but it's hard to find because, first of all, no one's heard it, so you don't know what it is. And second of all, you don't know the name of the guy who did it. And thirdly, uh, there isn't much, even if they were relatively prolific composers. So you have to find these single discs, and then you buy them, and you put them in your collection, and they vanish, because it's only a single disc. There isn't like a nice chunk of something that you can build upon and that strikes your eye every time you're looking for something to listen to. And one such I am going to talk about today. Yes, it is It is the the marvelous... Absolutely fabulous. Frederick Shepard Converse. Now, who the hell was Frederick Shepard Converse? There it is. There you go. Well, he was an American composer. He's part of the New England School. He taught at the New England Conservatory. He went to Harvard. You know, one of that one of that crew. And you know, the funny thing about them is that they all have like three names. There's like Frederick Shepard Converse. Let's think of a few others. There's John Knowles Payne. There's Daniel Gregory Mason. There's Charles Tomlinson Griffiths. There's John Alden Carpenter. I mean, I don't know where they all got three names from, but they all have three names. And the conductor of this fabulous disc has two names, Joanne Folletta. And basically, here's here's a way you can sort of deal with the the, the problem of finding these people. If it's Joanne Folletta and the Buffalo Symphony, buy it. <laughs> I mean, if it's someone you've never heard of, you know, you might want to think twice if it's like, you know, Respighi, you know, that you've got a big R section. Although her Respighi tone poem, the Roman trilogy is fabulous, by the way. But, but generally speaking, generally speaking, if you've got a composer you haven't heard of, and there's just one disc of his stuff, and Joanne Folletta and the Buffalo, the Buffalo Philharmonic, that's what it is, right? The Buffalo Philharmonic did them. Get them. Just get them and make a Joanne Folletta Buffalo Philharmonic collection. And, you know, on Naxos, and you'll have a really, really nice collection of top quality performances of unusual music. I mean, it's a it's a pretty simple, pretty simple project. And then you can find all these people. So Converse, let's get to him, shall we? He was born in 1871 and he died in 1940. That's a good period. That's really a good period. You know, one of the things that that we, we were taught in the in our peregrinations through the world of classical music was that there was a, a golden age of the orchestra. It was the classical period, the period of Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. That's not true. That isn't true at all. It's totally untrue because not only was the orchestra in a very primitive state of development in that period, relatively speaking, even though these composers transcended that and wrote you know amazing music and masterpieces, but the fact of the matter is that the modern symphony orchestra, as we understand it, as invented by Habeneck at the Paris Conservatoire, for example, in 1828, when it got started, that was the earliest one. And you hear you hear stories about how, like, oh, the oldest orchestra is the Leipzig Gewandhaus. It's 500 years old. It's nonsense. We're talking about regularly constituted modern orchestras that played that played regular series of music in a way we would recognize it now. That didn't really get started till the 1840s. And the orchestras that started it were the New York Philharmonic in 1842 and the Vienna Philharmonic in 1842. They're basically the same age. And then there was the Paris Conservatoire. Gradually, these things started to evolve. I mean, one of the things that always fascinated me is that most European orchestras are as young or younger than most American orchestras because they were municipal orchestras. And they got going when they got going at the end of the 19th century. And the great period of orchestra building historically was the 1880s and the 1890s. I mean, the Berlin Philharmonic in 1900 was a new orchestra. It was less than a decade old, the Berlin Philharmonic as we know it. And you know, we had orchestras, you know, the Boston Symphony was around the 1880s. The Concertgebouw was founded by Mengelberg in the, in the late in 1888, I think was the date. I mean, 
all of these orchestras started came into existence around the same time. And it was the last two decades, roughly, of the 19th century and the first decades of the 20th. And there's no advantage to being a European orchestra versus an American orchestra. It all happened at the same time because they were all playing the same repertoire and they were all supported by the same people, which was, you know, the growing middle class, upper middle class, you know, collection of arts consumers. And that's who supported these orchestras. And so and so it, it stands to reason that the the greatest, most colorful, most entertaining, most enjoyable orchestral music really couldn't be created unless there were orchestras out there that were going to play it. Because it wasn't like Haydn and Mozart's day when the repertoire created was for tiny, tiny, essentially chamber orchestras playing in, you know, aristocratic bathrooms, you know, and salons of, of great houses. You know, it, it had to be public concerts because the orchestras had 80, 90 people. And you had to have a certain certain critical mass in order to get them going. And so that's when they got going. And so the golden age of the orchestra, the true golden age of the orchestra, was began, I would say, with the death of Wagner in the 1880s and 1890s, because that's when you had the orchestras. And all of these people were superbly trained musicians who wrote glorious music for that late romantic orchestra. And we know, we know about Mahler and Strauss and, you know, and every so often someone else pops up. You can talk about Schrecker and Korngold and Franz Schmidt and some of these other people from Vienna, the Viennese crew. But Vienna was actually not the place to have an orchestra because the orchestra in Vienna was the Philharmonic, which was also the opera orchestra, which had a concert season that lasted about a dozen concerts a year. And that was it. That was it. You had to look to other places where the orchestral tradition was really getting going. And it was the same thing with the symphony, incidentally. You know, Wagner's stupid line about the symphony being dead, meaningless, meaningless drivel. It was dead in Germany for a variety of reasons, except for Brahms and Bruckner, basically. And after that, there was nothing <laughs> for like the rest of the 20th century. There were a couple. I mean, don't make a list. We know who they were. But, but the orchestral tradition, the symphonic tradition, went elsewhere. It went to England, it went to France, it went to Czechoslovakia, it went to the United States, it went to Scandinavia, hugely, hugely in Scandinavia, as all of these countries had their sort of romantic nationalist awakening in conjunction with the rise of the large symphony orchestra and composers trained to write for it. It's really, it's really that simple. And so this guy, Frederick Shepard Converse, was one of them. He was one of these New England composers, and this marvelous disc contains three tone poems. Now, the New England school ranged from the very conservative, as in, you know, Mrs. Ha Ha Beach, you know, Amy Beach, to the more, the more sort of interesting. Uh, among them, you know, John Alden Carpenter, this guy, Converse, Charles Tomlinson Griffiths, you know, they, 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 they were more interested in more, more modern things. You know, Charles Martin Loeffler, you know, three names. They all have to have three names or they don't count. They have three names. And so, and so I, I am delighted to introduce you to this fabulous disc uh, with the Buffalo Philharmonic conducted by Joanne Folletta. Now, the three pieces are the Mystic Trumpeter, Fliver 10 Million, and Endymion's Narrative. Now, these last two were recorded previously on a sort of creaky Louisville disc, um, and this is just superior in every way, so let's not even go there, I mean, in making the comparison. The Mystic Trumpeter, as some of you may know, is a poem by Walt Whitman, which I find absolutely intolerable. It's one of those, oh, trumpeter, trumpet your trumpet, so that I may be your trumpeting trumpeter as you trumpet with your trumpeting trumpeting trumpet, etc for about like, you know, lots of stanzas. And it's, 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 you know, like all these poems, it's about different emotional moods, happy, sad, you know, ends with joyful, which is good. We like joyful. Joyful is a good way to end. And Holst set the poem as a, as a sort of giant Shana for, for a soprano and orchestra. And not one of his more mature works, but it's a lovely work all the same. But this is just a purely orchestral tone poem, about 20 minutes long, 
And what this shows, and Endymion's narrative, by the way, and Endymion is a, a poem by, I think it's Keats, one of those guys. It's another one of those, uh, you know, really long poems. Uh, and it's also about, you know, spiritual awakening and oneness and unity. And it's all very heavy and pretentious and it doesn't make any difference. It's about emotional states. It's about happy and sad. And it ends with joyful. And again, joyful endings are good. You know, if I'm repeating myself, it's because so does the emotional sequence of these two tone poems. But they, they actually sound rather different. And, you know, one of the things that you could really count on Frederick Shepard Converse, he knew how to write a climax. Both of these pieces date from the beginning of the 20th century, and they're written in that sort of Wagner slash Tchaikovsky opulent late romantic style. And it's a wonderful no holds barred style. Now, Converse wrote five symphonies, which I haven't heard. I would love to hear them. Someone should record them. It would be just terrific. If somebody would do stuff like that, I mean, there we, we need to hear this music. But, but uh, you know, it'd be interesting to know if his symphonies are as unbuttoned as his symphonic poems, because because I, I tend to suspect suspect not. But you know, I wouldn't want to prejudge the case. Let's listen to just one of the sort of climactic moments from Endymion's narrative, and it just shows you just how, how splendidly he writes and sort of how much like Tchaikovsky he sounds. Not as much like Tchaikovsky as that Bantock creature's Thalaba the Destroyer, which is sort of shameless ripoff Tchaikovsky. This is more like inspired and writing in the same vein as Tchaikovsky and Wagner and Strauss and, you know, those people. And yeah, oh, it's all wonderful. What's not to love? Listen to this. And this is a great performance, really well recorded, and really well played. A bit of Endymion's narrative. Wasn't that fun? That's really cool. But for me, for me, the really exciting thing on this disc is Fliver 10 Million. Now, what is a Fliver 10 Million? Well, first of all, this was composed later. It was composed around 1930 or somewhere in there, and um, you know, or in the 1930s. And it shows, first of all, that Converse really did sort of evolve as a composer. He became recognizably more modern in style as time went on, which is often a good thing if you start from a sort of, you know, fusty old traditional background, as Converse came from. And, and Fliver 10 Million is the story of the 10 millionth Ford motor car. And it's just marvelous. It was written with under the inspiration of Honegger's Pacific 231, you know, about the railroad train. So it's a, a an industrial mechanical piece, but only part of the way, because only only for the part where Fliver is getting is getting built. And Fliver does get built in a factory. It is the only symphonic poem I know that begins with Dawn over Detroit, which I just think is amazingly evocative and poetic. And then the factory gets revving up. You know, the factory whistle goes off, the sirens go off, and the hammers and chains and machines start whirring and buzzing. And out comes Fliver. And on the way, Fliver has sort of a romantic episode, and he gets into a 
terrible car crash and has to go into the garage for repairs, but ultimately lives happily ever after, our Fliver the Ford. And it's just, it's, it's a humorous, delightful, carefree, immaculately written piece that just shows tremendous imagination and craft and an unbuttoned sense of fantasy. And I'm going to play a little bit of the, the construction of Fliver. Here we go. Isn't that just the kind of thing you want to have in your collection? Seriously. You know, it's a novelty, a wonderful novelty. It bears repetition very well. There are so many beautiful touches of orchestration and good tunes. And, it, you know, it's got all the things that you're going to want to listen to it more than once. And the title, Fliver 10 Million, is something you may actually remember because there are not too many pieces called Fliver 10 million. I mean, you know, Endymion gets gets mixed up with all of those, you know, Greek things. And the Mystic Trumpeter, well, it's a Whitman setting. <laughs> and, you know, one Whitman setting, you've heard one Whitman setting, you've heard them all, right? But Fliver 10 million, this is, a, this is special. This is really special. And so is this disc of Frederick Shepard Converse with, again, Joanne Folletta and the Buffalo Philharmonic on Naxos. This is an amazing series of stuff that they've done. And even I, you know, I mean, I reviewed this, I don't know, what was it, 10 years ago, 2010 or something when it came out. And I've listened to it several times since. But, you know, it, it, I was thinking of what should I talk about? And I wanted to do something that was one of these singleton discs by composers you may not have heard of or may not know, but who deserve the recognition. And so the reason I do so many of these these things is because this is sort of a, a go-to choice where you know you're going to get top quality results. And and so and so I chose this disc to talk about today. And there will be more. There will be plenty more because they've done a remarkable series of work. And I'm so happy about it. I really am because it's it's just we need first class recordings of this music. And then what we need is follow up. You find a composer like Frederick Shepard Converse and he writes this terrific stuff and we need to hear other things that he did. I mean, he wrote operas. He was the first American composer to have an opera produced at the Met. He was, he was a very, very serious guy in his day. And, and it seems to me that uh, a lot of the reason that this generation of composers was, was ignored and fell into dissuadude is because they were not modern enough. You know, they weren't part of the avant-garde. They weren't part of the second VD school. And then, of course, you know, all the other horrible ensuing things in modern music happened during the latter half of the 20th century. And nobody was going to revive this stuff. But the fact is, the orchestras are there and they're looking for stuff to do. And if audiences weren't so hidebound and programming wasn't so conservative and dreary, people like Joanne Folletta would be running like the most important biggest orchestras and playing this stuff and people would be flocking to hear it. And if you believe that, I have some swampland in New Jersey that you may be interested in investing in. In the meantime, 
Keep on listening to Frederick Shepard Converse and all of the other marvelous musicians who pop up in this fabulous series of American classics on Naxos. So there it is. Take care and thanks for joining me.